بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أنا الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ما يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يدلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله وسلامه عليه تسليم كثيرا أما بعد فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محتثاتها وكل محتثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار as most of you know, I just came back from a trip to Al Kuwait. It's my first time visiting Al Kuwait. I want to share a few issues with you, brothers, especially those of you, because we see many of you are focused on trying to go to Al Medina or Mecca or Al Qasim or some of those universities that are located in Saudi Arabia all of which we would advise you to try to get into, but it's becoming increasingly difficult due to many factors and many reasons. We don't think that it's wise for brothers to put all of their eggs in one basket, especially in light of the fact there are other opportunities, some more easier than others. There is knowledge in India, and there is knowledge in Pakistan, there's knowledge of al-hadith in Afghanistan. We're not going to encourage anyone to go there due to the lack of stability in some circumstances and also because the quality of living sometimes is a bit difficult to deal with concerning people who are used to living in the UK, living in America, living in the West. Nonetheless, about five or six months ago, I was invited by one of the many masajid that I go to in Leicester to translate for a sheikh who had came to the UK from the group Jum'iyya Ihya Turaf, the group that cooperates with this masjid here, Green Lane Masjid. Some of the scholars of Islam have criticized this particular group and others have praised them, whatever the case may be. We say we take the khay wherever we find it and we leave the evil wherever we find it. And we don't make wala wal bara on these issues the way some people understand al wara al wala and bara. If they were going to write a book about the minhaj al salafi, like the scholars wrote in the past, Sharh al Sunnah, Usul al Sunnah, someone says, You sit down and write the aqidah that you're upon. So the person wants to write the usul of the Sunnah according to him, he'll put in that and believe that the Quran is the kalam of Allah. We love the companions, and we have to free ourselves from jam'i'iyya turaf. You'll see that from the usul of the sunnah. And this is not the case, as you're going to see, inshallah, as we general. Ala kullin, this particular sheikh, Dawood al-Asrusi, hafidhullah wa ra'ahullah, he came to the Masjid al-Furqan, which is a masjid that is predominantly visited by and taken care of by people from the Somali culture and background. I won't call it a Somali masjid because all of the masjid, they belong to Allah Azza wa Jalla. So no one owns the masjid, but there are Somalis in that masjid. So I went, and when I met him, and we began to talk, he had remembered that I translated for him a long time ago, 15 years ago or something like that, back in America in Florida, when I lived in Orlando, Florida. And I didn't remember, but nonetheless, I did the translation for him. And then a few days later, he traveled to Darby, a masjid that I give a khutbah there, a really nice masjid, called Masjid As-Salam. Masjid As-Salam, under the leadership of the Libyan sheikh, who's one of the people of knowledge in this country that not many people know about, Abu Hassan, who's from Libya. Anyway, they did a program as well, and they wanted the community to know what the sheikh was saying, so they invited me, and I did another translation for him. When I was in Leicester doing the translation, he was happy with the translation, so he said to me, would you like to visit Al-Kuwait? 
just visit. I said, sure, I'll visit it, no problem. He said, okay, when we have the program in Derby, bring your paperwork, bring your passport, bring a picture, bring some papers showing that you graduated and things like that. So I did it and I gave it to him and we proceeded two or three days with the program and I forgot about it. After about five months, three or four weeks ago, he contacted me through WhatsApp and he said, are you ready to come during this time and that time? I said, sure. So I went to Kuwait for about a week or something like that. And I went to Kuwait with official invitation from the Sheikh Daoud al Asrusi, who has a very high position with the Wazarat Al-Uqaf, the Ministry of Endowments and Islamic Affairs. He has a very high and important position with that uh, institution. And that group, or that Wazara, that ministry, is resp responsible for overseeing all of the durus and all of everything that has to do with Islam. So there is a ministry in the Muslim world, not just in Kuwait, many people, places, Saudi Arabia, many places, the sole job and function of that particular wazara ministry is to take care of the religious affairs. Who's going to give the fatwa? Who's going to talk? Who's going to come to the masjid? Who's going to come and be the imam in the masjid? And all of the issues dealing with al-Islam. So when I arrived there on Sunday, we didn't have anything to do. I actually had a really nice and easy time. They didn't put a lot of responsibility on me. I didn't do any talks that were public talks until the Thursday before I left. And the Friday, I did the khutbah in a masjid called Masjid Al-Uthman. And it was an amazing situation because all of the expats that are there, many Americans, people from Britain, all over Britain, I met brothers who I hadn't seen in a long time, Pakistani, Bangladesh, Indonesian, Malaysian, any and everybody who spoke English, they went to this masjid, Masjid Al-Uthman. I was a bit shocked because that is the land of the Arabs. It's the Khalij, the Gulf, the Jazirat Al-Arab, where the Prophet used to walk and his da'wah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, started from that land. And yet, they made a masjid for the people who were there who don't speak Arabic so that they can understand the khutbah. And then we come here to the UK, to America, where people speak English and they make the khutbah Urdu, or they make the khutbah Arabic. I thought it was just ma'akus. I, I thought it was just really surreal and bizarre. So they gave them a masjid exclusively for them. Just people who speak English. And they had a lot of activity in that masjid as well. Weekly classes, different people who are living there, giving classes, and plus, they're always bringing people. And alhamdulillah, I participated with them on that Thursday. So on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, that time was just spent going to lessons myself and getting an opportunity to meet the people of knowledge from Al Kuwait. And I have to say, I traveled many places, seven continents, and I traveled within those seven continents by Allah's permission to many places. I've never been to a place, never, ever, not Saudi Arabia, Mecca, Medina, other than that, where I saw the brotherhood of Serafia on a balanced way like I saw it in Al Kuwait, where I saw the people on a Serafia who were balanced like I saw in Kuwait. The people of Hulu, you don't even see them, you don't even hear about them because the shiuch who they have there in Al Kuwait are not even, they're not even known as being students of knowledge. They're businessmen and so forth and so on. So in Kuwait itself, you don't know about this da'wah of Al Ghulu. All you find is people are Salafi, or they may be other things, but you don't find that Ghulu. And the presence of the Salafi shiuch as well as the Tulab, who are Salafi, I was extremely impressed. Another thing about Kuwait that was different from any other place that I've been in the Gulf states is that Kuwait is an open society. It's not a closed society. It's not a military state. So you'll find that the Kuwaiti people are extremely accommodating, extremely open and sociable, unlike Saudi Arabia. I remember when I went to Saudi Arabia, uh, a few weeks back, we went to a nikah. I didn't know who was getting married, but one of the brothers we were with, we went to that nikah. And when we sat 
at the table. We were about three or four. And then there were about seven people we didn't know. You'll find that those people won't talk to you. If you don't engage them in the discussion, they won't talk to you. And that's usually how it is. A society where people in Saudi Arabia mind their own business. Not everybody is like that, but generally, that's the adept of the place. It's not to be so sociable. But Kuwait is not like that. You're not going to pray in any masjid in that country. For the most part, this is my experience. And with the colors that I wear, the clothes that I wear, people can see I'm not from that place. So any random masjid where I prayed, going out of that masjid, putting my shoes on, you would always find people coming up to you saying, where are you from? Would you like to come to my house and come onto my house? But I didn't have time to go to people's homes like that because I had my own program. They have this thing in Al Kuwait, Ikhwani, it's called the Diwaniya. The Diwaniya. I'm going to say it, I want you to say it. It's not a Sufi dhikr. I just want you to learn this new Arabic word. Diwaniya. Diwaniya. Yeah, the Diwaniya in the Arabic language means a lot of things. The Diwan can be the book that the Muslim leader has, and in it are the names of all of the soldiers that are protecting the Muslim lands. Everybody's name who is making a jihad fi sabirillah is written in that book with his salary and what he's doing and what he's responsible. That's one of the meanings of the diwan. It can mean a lot of things, but in this case with the Kuwaitis, it's a social event, a social event. We're after Salat al-Maghrib, after Salat al-Isha, every single day, on every single street, almost in every house, you are given an open invitation just to go to someone's house, knock on the door, and you go in and you eat or drink kahwa or you drink tea and eat dates. If you're fasting, you just go in and you, whether you know them, you don't know them. And the people make you feel comfortable, whether you know them and you don't, or you don't know them. I thought that was an amazing thing. I saw something similar to that in Saudi Arabia when I went to a place called Ha'il. Ha'il. There was a big sheikh there. When I was studying, his name is Abdullah ibn Saleh. Al-Ubaylan, a sheikh Al-Ubaylan, Hafizullah Bura'a, Ha'il is one of the places in Saudi Arabia that have still maintained the way of the old, old Arabs in terms of their karam. So you could just pull your car up off of the road and go into anyone's tent that's in front of his house, or the side of his house, and there's always a fire running, and you can always drink coffee, you can always eat dates, but you may not find the owner of the house in there. You just go in yourself, you and your crew, and you just hang out and get up and you leave. But in Al Kuwait, it was on another level. There was always food. There were always other things. Now, the irreligious people, people who don't have deen, they waste time at the diwaniya. They play cards. They watch TV. They watch what's haram, and they waste time. But the religious people, the practicing people, they said, let us take advantage of this diwaniya and make it something that's religious. And I remember one time, I did... A translation for the Sheikh, Annan Abdul Qadir, who's from Al Kuwait, Hafizullah Ta'ala wa Ra'a. And he was talking about the importance of time. And he was talking about how we, they come from, they have this diwaniya. I couldn't even translate it because I didn't know what he was talking about. And it is something that can waste your time. That if you go there every day, if you can imagine, all through Maghrib, after Isha, it can go up to 12, 1 o'clock. If you're doing that all the time, you're going to waste a lot of time. So the religious people, the practicing people, they came up with the idea of utilizing this particular time in order to bring a sheikh to give a lesson, to give advice. If the people came to the diwaniya, they'll choose someone from the audience, give some kind of nasiha about brotherhood, about sabr, about a taqwa, about whatever comes to your mind, Provided you know what you're talking about and so forth and so on. So anyway, I arrived on Sunday. On Monday, the first diwaniya that I went to was pretty important because I met there the owner of the house who was a young Kuwaiti. He was younger than me. He was a young Kuwaiti. His kunya is Abu Ghanam and his name was Walid al Ghanam. He belongs to one of the most prestigious and prosperous and powerful families of Al Kuwait. He had heard that I was coming. He had heard about me, obviously, because he's involved with the English Dawa. So he asked a brother who was in contact with me to bring me there because they were fasting on Monday. Every Monday and Thursday, 
he, along with maybe five or six of his friends, they fast all the time. Anyone who wants to go there can go there. Very affluent area. You can just go. So I went and I met him. He was very uh, generous. It was really a nice opportunity. The thing about this brother, Abu Ghanim, Hafizullah Ta'ala, was the fact that he was one of the people who's responsible for bringing Dr. Zak and Naik to Al Kuwait and giving those types of programs. Because there are a lot of people in Al Kuwait that speak English, a lot of people in Al Kuwait who are Christians, who are atheists, or whatever. So they bring Dr. Zak and Naik in about two or three weeks. He's going to be coming, inshallah, along with the other brother, the other sheikh that comes on TV. His name is Muhammad Saleh. I think you guys know that sheikh, right? Muhammad Saleh, who's on Huda TV. I think he's from Egypt. I'm not sure. He speaks English very well. And Yusuf Estez. Yusuf Estez. And, and, and Ustad, Yusuf Estez. May Allah give him shifa, inshallah, azawajal. So in talking to him, I saw he had a lot of ideas about how he wanted to, to help the Dawah in the West, the Dawah, the English Dawah. So that particular sitting with him showed me that he is an individual who those of you who are busy with giving Dawah like they give Dawah in city center, for an example, in city center, different people around this country are giving Dawah. There are a number of people that I felt that I met there in Kuwait who are really willing and ready to get behind people to finance those types of programs. I mean, quite a few people. So I was really impressed with the fact that so many regular people, he wasn't a student of knowledge as such, he wasn't a sheikh as such, a knowledgeable person. He was just a man that Allah is blessed with some means, some wealth. He, along with the people that he know from his, uh, his ashab, and they had good hearts, inshallah, pure hearts, and they wanted to make the tasheer of their resources for the dawah of al-Islam. So if any of you brothers are interested, if you have some type of project, some type of program, you let me know, inshallah, I'll put you in contact with him. And he's not a dumb person. He used to study in Austria. He told me that he also married a lady when he was in Austria. She's from Bosnia. And that was the thing about the Kuwaiti people, that because they traveled all over and they're going outside of their country and they're meeting many people inside of their country, I found them to be people who were very open-minded. Many of them spoke English and many of them knew what was going on. And traveling is really important. When we look at Surah Al-Kaf and the story of Khidr, Khidr and Musa, alayhi salawatullahi wa salamuhu, one of the benefits of that story is the benefit of traveling for knowledge. Allah mentioned many ayats of the Quran and commanded, فَسِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ فَانْظُرُوا كَيْفَ كَانَ عَاقِبَةُ الْمُكَذِّبِينَ Travel within the earth and look at what was the end result of those people who denied and rejected and disbelieved. Many ayat of the Quran command the Muslim to travel. Travel is going to be a part of a person's life whether he likes it or he doesn't like it. He has to go for Umrah. He has to go for Hajj. He has to go and get a job. He has to visit his relatives. He's going to go to a Nikah and Walima here and there and there and there. So in traveling, you're going to get knowledge that you don't get from the place that you are, whether it's in the deen or whether it's secular. You're going to travel to London to get a degree. Travel outside of this country to get a degree. From the benefits of traveling as well is to learn from what other people are doing. And that's why we found the scholars of the past always traveling. And the scholar who traveled is not like the scholar who doesn't travel. Some of the ulama, Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is better than Al Kuwait, clearly, because the Prophet said that, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when Medina to Khairul Lahum Lokana Ya'lamun, Lokanu Ya'lamun. One of the signs of the out signs of the hours that people are going to be leaving Al Medina. And he said, Medina is better for them if they only knew you should stay in Medina. A Dajjal can't get into al Medina, can't get into Mecca. So those two places are the two best places on the face of the earth. Also from the angle of the ulama, Kuwait, they do not have the ulama on the level of what they have in Saudi Arabia. And as a result of that, the Kuwaitis, the shiuch, and their students, their faces are looking at the ulama of Saudi Arabia. Not that only Saudi Arabia has the ulama of that level. 
but to have so many in one country, this is one of the misas that they have. No one else shares with them in that issue. Put that aside. Mecca and Medina and those ulama, put that aside. The Kuwaiti shiuk were a bit different though. The Kuwaiti shiuk, that sheikh that's going to travel to Pakistan, he's going to travel to India, he's going to travel to Afghanistan, he's going to travel to Russia, America, the UK, and he's looking at the people, he's seeing the people, he's going to get and he's going to develop experiences and knowledge and information that the sheikh who doesn't leave will not get. That's not to put any sheikh down, but that's the reality. One of the greatest scholars of Al-Islam, Al-Imam Ibn Hazm, Muhammad Ibn Hazm, who was from Spain. He was on the Zahiri Madhab. He's one of the best and biggest scholars in Al-Islam. If you avoid his shidda, he was really rough and tough with the one who didn't agree with him. So the scholars always advise, don't start when you become a new student of knowledge and you're in the Bidaya. Don't read the books of Ibn Hazm, the book Al Muhalla, because if you disagree with him, as Abu Hanifa's Madhab used to disagree with him, so he would really go in on Al Imam Abu Hanifa, and he would really go off on people. And I've seen with my own eyes some of the brothers who came to Salafia new, and they were students who were new in Al Medina, and they used to read Al Muhalla a lot. They were very difficult to deal with and very intolerant, very intolerant. The mas'ala, it could be understood that way and it could be understood that way. So don't treat the brother as if he's an idiot for taking the other position. Anyway, and Imam Ibn Hazm, he never left Spain and Andalus, never left it with all of that knowledge. Never made Umrah, never made Hajj, never left Spain. So when he came to the issue, and this man has knowledge, unlike any scholar today, unlike any scholar, this man is on another level. When he came to the issue about Al-Hajj, he has one of the best books about how to perform Hajj and the ikhtilaf of Al-Hajj and the Hajj of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But he wrote in that book that when you perform Hajj and you're going to do the sa'i between As-Safa and Al-Marwa, how many of you made Umrah and Hajj? Put your right hands up if you made Umrah and Hajj. His opinion was when you do the sa'i from Safa and Marwa, you have to go start on that Safa you have to start from Safa, you have to go up to Marwa and come back, and that's one. You go back up and you come back, and that's two. You go up and you come back, and that's three. And you have to do that seven times. When there's Ramadan and doing Hajj, you're only supposed to do one. That's the Sunnah of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And during the time of Ramadan and Hajj, when you do one from Safa to Marwa, that one takes 40 minutes, 45 minutes, one hour. He said, you have to come back again. And then go and come back again. Rahmatullahi alayhi. But why did he say that? He said that because, number one, no scholar has encompassed all of the religion. Number two, kullu bani Adam khatta'un. All of Adam's children make mistakes. All of them make mistakes. From the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa with some of those companions who gave fatwas, Ridwan Allahi alayhim, and the truth, the haq, wasn't with that fatwa. And sometimes the fatwa that they gave will make a person laugh. Like what happened with Umar radiallahu anhu and Ammar ibn Yasir. May Allah be pleased with both of them. Well, they both woke up on a trip and they had janaba. They needed to make ghusl, but there was no water. So the Salat of Al-Fajr was coming in. Ammar ibn Yasir, he knows you can make tayammum. He knows that the earth will purify you. It has the ability to purify you. So what did he do? He rolled around in the dirt like a daba, the way a horse or donkey would roll around in the dirt to clean itself off, to get the bugs off, to clean itself off. The animals roll around in the dirt. So he did that. And because he needed a ghusl, all of the water, he rolled all in the dirt and got himself all dirty. Umar looked at him and said, I'm not doing that. He said, I'm not doing that. And all Umar did was, he prayed without any wudu. Without any wudu. When they got to al Medina and they told the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet smiled. And he told them, Kana yakfik and taf'al hakada. It was enough for you just to do like this. Hit the earth like this and do your hands and then do your face and do tayammum. 
and that would have sufficed you because you didn't have any water. So the point is, based upon his ijtihad, Ahmad ibn Yasser rolled around in the dirt. If you were to look at that, the Prophet himself smiled at it, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. So there's not a single person except people make mistakes in big issues, middle, media, in media, media, medium issues, and in small issues as well. Ala kullin, ala kullin. As it relates to this particular issue of the scholar who travels, the sheikh that I met recently in Saudi Arabia, in the last program that I went to, a sheikh, Abdullah al usaymi he went everywhere. He went everywhere. Mauritania, Mali, Pakistan, India, Afghanistan, Egypt, Syria, everywhere you can think of. He even learned English. He met with a sheikh, uh, Abu Suhaib Hassan's father, and he knew him as well because he went all the way to Pakistan just to read on his father the Sunan of Al Imam at Tirmidhi. And then when you sit with him, along with other people who come from different parts of the world, you see the experience of traveling, coming out of the man, coupled with the knowledge of the deen. So traveling, Ikhwani, is important. Where I come from, and many of the areas where we come from, one of the messages that I try to tell these people when I go back to where I come from, tough place, a bad place. So I try to tell these kids, whether they're Muslims or not, you only know this small city where you are, the city of Birmingham. That's all you know. So your life and your experiences, you're going to look at life through the prism of this small city of Birmingham. If you only knew, if you got a passport and you got a ticket and you went to Kathmandu, you just went to somewhere outside of this place, your horizons were broaden, and you realize you don't have to be a bum. Just travel outside of where you live and you'll realize you can make a way for yourself, inshallah ta'ala, outside of this small environment where you live. If you can imagine, one of us only stays in his house. That's it. Never comes out of his house like that woman of the past, the woman today. That lady hardly ever comes out of her house. When she has to go to city center, she gets lost. She doesn't know what she's doing. If a person only stayed in their house, they wouldn't know anything about what's going on from the beginning of the street all the way to the end of the street. You guys, you have to travel. Travel for knowledge in the deen, knowledge and experience of the dunya, and even knowledge for leisure. Travel just to see. There's more things out there in the dunya in the world that you don't know than what you've been exposed to. On Tuesday, it was a big day because for the lunchtime, the people from the Ministry of Oqaf they wanted to honor their guests that they brought. And I wasn't the only one there. I happened to be there with the Mufti of Mauritania. He is the Sheikh Ahmed Al Murabit, who I had met about two years ago in a program that I was invited to go to and participate in Al Riyadh. That program was called Nabi Rahma. The King of Saudi Arabia put that program together and he invited ulama from all over the world. He invited different researchers, Muslims from all over the world to put together papers to present, to push back the backlash that came from that program draw Muhammad Day. So the scholars and the people came together with these papers to indicate, to show the people, no, our Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a Nabi of Rahmah. He was a Nabi of Rahmah for women, for children, for the elderly, for the sick, he was a Nabi of Ar-Rahmah towards the animals, a Nabi of the Rahmah for the Malaika, for the Jan, for everyone, as Allah mentioned in the Quran, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِنَّ رَحْمَةٍ لِلْعَالَمِينَ We didn't sing you except as a Rahmah to all of the worlds. Anyway, I met the Sheikh there, but we didn't get an opportunity to really chop it up because they gave him special, special treatment. He's the Mufti of Mauritania. So he had guards, and we didn't really have access to him as such, although we ate with him, but we didn't get a chance to really sit with him. And unfortunately, at that particular program, he was the only one that they allowed to perform Umrah. The rest of us, we got our tickets and we had to come back. And it was a bit of a problem, but nonetheless, we got a chance to meet and to see different people. The sheikh came this time and I got a chance to meet 
and to sit with him uh, for the lunch. I was amazed. I don't think there's any place on the face of the earth in Allah knows best that is similar to Mauritania when it comes to getting knowledge. If you go to Somalia and other parts of Africa, there's emphasis that they placed on memorizing the Quran. And they may put the youngster in a camp, in a village, in a madrasa that's kind of tough, where they don't have a lot to eat and it's tough. And you write on those boards and the ink and it's tough. But Mauritania is second to none with the emphasis that they put upon memorizing the classic works and books in Arabic, in Tajweed, in Fiqh, and so forth and so on. Memorizes. Hufav. And he was upon that way. But the difference between him and the other Mauritanians, because we know the brother who's in um, America, he used to be quite popular until the Gulf War when he started saying things that people didn't like because he doesn't understand al-wala wal bara And then the people started to push him away. The white brother who's a Sufi who used to go to Mauritania. We used to hear about his stories about how they studied in Mauritania. So we know that that's the way of studying. Even Sufis study like that. But I was impressed with the Sheikh Ahmed and Murabit in that he was a Salafi Sheikh who memorized, who knew the Maliki Madhat like he knew his own children, who memorized the Quran and when he used to give classes, all of his dalil were from the Quran, who memorized the ahadith of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as if it was his actual vocabulary. I used to be amazed at the way he used to present his talks. And I used to see he would make a jihad to stay on the point. Because when he's talking about a particular point, because of all of that information that he has, he would wind up talking about other things and you have to bring him back to the point. But when he talked about those other things, it wasn't that it was not related. It was just the man had an ocean and a well of knowledge. But he was sedefi and he was balanced. He was extremely balanced. So he was there when I was there. Also at that lunch, I got an opportunity to meet one of the amazing people of Al Kuwait from the people of knowledge. And he's originally from Afghanistan. He's an Afghani, but he's been there for a long time, and now he's a professor in the university. His name is Sheikh Muhammad Ibn Jamil and Nuristani. Hafidhullah wa Ra'a. He's a tremendous scholar of Al Hadith, tremendous scholar of Al Aqidah. And although, and this is something that I was amazed to see, although he's from Afghanistan originally, which is not a curse, and it's not a knock against him, but although he's from Afghanistan, from Afghanistan originally, you can see that in the way he looks, the people there raised him in high degree because of his knowledge. Now, I've seen that in other places in the Muslim world. I've seen that in other places. But you do have in the Gulf states this thing about an asabi, a racism. It's not only there. It's in Pakistan. It's in India, Afghanistan, and Somalia. It's everywhere. The Prophet said that racism, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, would never be left by this ummah. min amur al-jahiliyyah tatrukuha ummati abada. Three things are from the times of jahiliyyah. My ummah will never leave these three things. And niyaha al mate when a person is screaming and wailing, over the dead person, over the dead person. That people talk bad about where other people come from and they brag about where they come from. Racism. All the Muslim countries have racism. But with the Arabs, it's ashed. With the Arabs, it's a'zam. Don't get me wrong now. I know some Pakistanis who are bona fide racists should be in the KKK. Should be with the BNP. Real straight up racists. Straight up. But generally speaking, the Arabs had that thing. They had it in Jahiliyyah. And that's why the Prophet told them, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Alaykum as Sama wa Ta'a wa inta amra alaykum abdun habashiyun. You people have to listen and obey the ruler. Anyone who is a ruler over you have to listen and obey him. Even if it is an Ethiopian slave that becomes your leader. A slave can't be the leader over the Muslims. It's not permissible. But he gave them that example to show this is something you really hate. That an Ethiopian person would be over you. You would never tolerate that.
But if it happened, you have to listen to them and you have to obey them. Because that was part of how they were and the prophet came and he cleaned that stuff up or he addressed it, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. I was impressed with the way they treated him. They put him very high up and he deserved it. The Sheikh Abu Abdullah, Muhammad ibn Jabil, and Nur Astani. And when I say to you, brothers, that he's a person of knowledge, I'm not saying that he can give a nice khutbah, a nice daras that will make you feel good. I'm talking about knowledge of al-hadith. I'm talking about knowledge of al-aqidah, knowledge of fiqh, knowledge of the waqa, of the people, what they need, what the shabab are in need of, and so forth and so on. So at that particular lunch, that was the highlight, being with the sheikh, the mufti of Mauritania, and being with the sheikh and Nuristani, who I was introduced to or told about by my brother Abu Muawiyah, who's a brother who's originally from America. He's a Caucasian American brother who embraced the religion. He's been in Kuwait for about three years, living there right now, alhamdulillah. He was the one who was taking me to these ulama and exposing me to them. May Allah Azza wa give him the khayr of the dunya and the khayr of the akhirah and make things easy for him. The next day, Ikhwani, which was the Wednesday, I had the opportunity to meet for the first time the Sheikh Salem at tawil Sheikh Salem at tawil I don't know if you brothers have heard of him, but he's one of the sheikhs from Al-Kuwait who is actually putting the fire out of some of the shiyukh of al Medina who have ghulu and who teach the students here in the UK from SP their ghulu. He addresses the Sheikh Muhammad ibn Hadi al Madkhali with nice words. He addresses him and he writes different things to him, advising him, challenging him. And not only him, but all of them. Similar to the Sheikh Ahmed al Najjar, Hafidullah, Wara'a. So there are shaykh who are out there who are dealing with that stuff. And if you're exposed to it, you will see that the Sheikhs of Al Ghulu, they don't go back and forth with these people because their hujjaj are damaging against them. I never met a Sheikh Salam at tawil but I knew that he went to America. And I knew that before he was connected with these brothers along with the Sheikh Falah Ismail, who I didn't get a chance to meet. I've never met him before. I was shocked. When I went into the diwania of a Sheikh Salam al tawil he was given a class, and then after the class, you go and you eat. So when the brother brought me in, and he told him, this is Abu Sam al Dhahabi. He said, al Dhahabi. The al Dhahabi from the UK, from America. And we started to talk. He opened up the subject about all of the drama that's going on between the Salafi people and the drama of what he saw from the people of Ghulu, and he wrote this stuff as well. I was shocked because he was supposed to give a class about a weekly program that he's doing in Adab and Akhlaq. He suspended that class, and for about one hour, 15 minutes, he just talked to the people about his experiences with the mentality of the brothers who come from the West, this Dawah of Ghulu, how one day you're the sheikh, and the next day they won't come to pick you up and they won't come to visit you. How one day they have respect for you and the next day they don't have respect for you because they blindly follow those people who are propping them up. So if you don't get with that program, your dawah, they're not going to respect you. I was shocked that he took all of that time to talk about that issue. But I apologized to the sitters and I told them, look, I didn't come here to talk about this. I came here to meet the sheikh because I saw that he was with those brothers a long time ago and I used to think he was like them. But when I listened to his talks that he gave to the brothers in America, when I listened to his talks that he gave to these brothers in the UK, I realized he wasn't like them. He wasn't exposing those brothers to that, that there's no benefit whatsoever. Someone comes and he sits in my class for the first time, I'm going to start talking to him about the false principles of Abu Hassan al-Ma'rabi 
and the false principles of Ali Hassan Al Halabi, and he doesn't know anything about the basics of a Tawheed. But that's what I'm engaging all of the people in. That's not our Dawa. That's not our Dawa. There's no benefit in that. That's beneficial to the people who have nothing else to give. As for teaching people the alum of this deen, no. So when I saw that, I realized he's not from them. He's addressing issues that the people need. And that's why ultimately the split came between them and him because he wasn't on that nonsense. But it was an awesome opportunity to have gotten to meet him. I thought that he was a real strong individual just the way his writings are and his bravery is when he writes. I realized that in real life he was the same way. So I say to you brothers, Sheikh Salam al-Tawil, many of his talks have been translated on the internet and they're beneficial. His information is beneficial and he's one of those good sheikhs there in Al-Kuwait that the people have respect for and that the people also, they, uh, they look up to him. And in addition to that, Ikhwani, we had the opportunity to give that khutbah that I told you, that daras in the masjid the following day. And um, I felt sorry for those brothers who were there because I tell you, a lot of the brothers, they think when you go to the Middle East, you're going to be a student of knowledge and you're going to work at the same time. And usually that's not the case. It's difficult. You either got to do this or you have to do that. So my advice to those brothers in the lesson that I gave, after the lesson that I gave, was to impress upon them the importance of the fact that Allah Azawajal had allowed them to come to the Arab world. So I was advising them not to leave this place without learning how to read the Quran correctly. It's okay to go to a lecture here, a lecture there, Friday night, Thursday night, and you want to have some Islamic activities that you do collectively with your family. That's okay for a dhikr. But you're not going to get real knowledge like that. You get reminders and you benefit here and there. Real knowledge comes from you sitting down and you learning this religion. I give an example here in this majlis right now. There's a brother who takes me back and forth sometimes on Tuesday to the masjid, back to my library for an example. I remember months ago, years ago, he started doing the Quran. His place of memorizing the Quran and reading the Quran today is not where he was a year ago. And that's because he's putting the time in to do it on a consistent basis. That's knowledge. If you're not doing that, you come to the class, this class, every Wednesday for an example, Alhamdulillah, for bihi wa ni'mah. But real knowledge is getting in that Quran class with that mudarras and you'll be able to gauge how much benefit have you derived from the first day that you enrolled to the day where you are right now. That's knowledge that you can look back and say, I developed myself. So my advice to those people was, you're not going to learn Arabic language because the people in the street are speaking colloquial and slang. But that Quran, don't leave that place without memorizing or without learning how to read the Quran and get memorization of the Quran. On the Friday, Ikhwani, I had the opportunity, alhamdulillah, after delivering the khutbah al Jum'ah, which was very difficult because I got sick there. Anytime I go to the Middle East, the air condition doesn't work for me, so I become a bit sick. So I had a very hoarse voice, but nonetheless, I delivered the khutbah and it killed my voice after that. After Salat al-Jum'ah, we rushed to the house of a Sheikh Faisal al jasim the one who used to come to Green Lane, the one who used to work and cooperate with the Jam'iyya Ihya Turab. He still comes. He set up the program or helped to set it up there in Luton at the beginning of this year. I never knew because when I first met a Sheikh Faisal al jasim he told me he studied in Denver, Colorado, and then he started getting knowledge later on in life. So I thought that he was one of the many people who come here from the du'at and the shiyukh who give da'wah to Allah. But as time went on and he started writing and I started seeing his books, I realized a Sheikh Faisal al-Jasim, he has knowledge. Mashallah. 
and he's mutamakkin in the knowledge that he has. He has a good understanding. But when I went to Al-Kuwait, I realized he was a person who was held in high esteem. He was respected more than what we realize what his situation is, his reality is. So I was really impressed with the fact that he was one of those people that was very busy giving dawah and another issue, why I'm telling you guys this personal experience. As Sheikh Faisal al-Jassim was responsible for, and he has connections, that after every so many months, he gets a group of brothers who want to go to Al-Kuwait to study extensively for three months or four months. And you go for free. So, okay, you can't go to al Medina. You can't go to Um al Qura. You may be too old, or the word hasn't come back that you've been accepted. So, instead of sitting in Green Lane Masjid or in Birmingham or sitting wherever you sit, get on the boat and get with that program. They bring brothers there from America for free, they bring brothers from the UK that's for free. If you're interested, in participating in that program, it'll be coming up, inshallah, all expenses paid for your trip, for your accommodation, and they break you off as well with an allowance, and you'll get the opportunity for four months to be exposed to that. So if you're interested in that, also let me know. If you can't go to Al Medina, if you can't go to the other places, okay, all is not lost. One of the diwaniyas that I was in, and it probably was the best one, was the one that I think it took place on Tuesday. It was on a Wednesday, on a Wednesday. Wednesday after Salat al-Isha, where the big shayukh of al-Kuwait had all came together in the house of this one brother, mashallah, who I hadn't met before, but he was extremely generous, really nice brother. And everybody was there. People who had, I saw their books, I had their books, but I never got a chance to meet them. Like Sheikh Badr al-Badr who is a sheikh who, he doesn't give a nice class or talk. He's not a speaker. But when it comes to research and making the tahqiq of the books of al-hadith and aqid and so forth and so on, he's second to none. Unfortunately, I didn't get an opportunity to see some of the other people that I know who are there in al-Kuwait, like the sheikh Muhammad Hamoud al-Najd. He's a tremendous person. I didn't get a chance to meet him. I didn't get a chance to meet sheikh Falah Ismail I heard that he was sick and so forth and so on, and there were others. But on the last day, you know, alhamdulillah, I got the chance to meet the last two sheikhs. After having the lunch with a sheikh Faisal, I met a brother who's from Kosovo, and we're going to bring him here, inshallah. Abu Abdul Razak. Abu Abdul Razak. Ahmed Hoja. His brother speaks about six or seven languages. He graduated from Kuliyat al Hadith in Al Medina. And now he's getting his PhD from Al Kuwait. One of those intelligent brothers, one of those people that Allah Azza gave him Al Aqal. Like our Imam is Zaka Allah or Zaka Allah. That brother is Zaki. Like the other Abu Abdul Razak, Tahir Wyatt. They're in Al Medina. Hafidhahumullah. There are some people from amongst us, whether it's in the deen or the dunya, but I'm talking about the deen. Some students, when it comes to education, Allah just made them extremely, incredibly smart and sharp. So when I first met this brother, Abu Abdul Razak Ahmed Hoja, I thought he was from Hisham, maybe from Jordan, Palestine. He's about 6'7", giant, and he has red hair. He's Ashqar, he has red hair, and he's white. Looks like he was from Sham. And he spoke Arabic unlike any other English speaker that I ever know, that I know. Someone who learned Arabic. I'm not talking about an English person who comes from UK, America. His mother and his father are Arabs and he was born here. I'm talking about someone who learned the language. So when I first met him in that majlis, the way he spoke English, all of that time I thought he was an Arab. And then we went down and we sat to eat because they're always slaughtering these lambs all the time in the diwaniya. Some people over there, some people over there, some over there. So I make sure I sit at the table where the head of the lamb is because... I love eating the lamb's head. It's amazing. All that meat in here is just amazing. He was sitting next to me and he was giving me meat and he was talking and then he spoke to me in English and then we started to get to know each other and mashallah, he really looked out for me because 
he had lunch with me in the house of a sheikh, Faisal al-Jasim. So after that, we went to the house after Salat al-Asr. We prayed al-Asr in the masjid of the nephew of al-Imam al-Albani. His name is Abdullah ibn Adam al-Albani. He prayed with us. We went to his office in the masjid. And mashallah, he looked just like al-Albani. Just like him, except he has red hen in his hair. If you look at him, he's a spitting image of al-Albani. Exactly like him. So he gave me about 45 minutes of his time just talking about all kind of issues about the deen and other than the deen. I was extremely impressed with how gentle he was, how much rahman and concern, how easy going he was. Because sometimes you can meet a sheikh that his way is, his way is, he's no nonsense, he doesn't smile, and that's not a knock on him, but some people are just like that. Al-Imam Al-A'mash, Al-Imam Al-A'mash, from the ulama of al-Hadith, they said that he was an anti-sociable person, that he wasn't an easy person to get to know, because he didn't want to deal with the people. People waste his time. People got too much kalam. So he was a bit anti-sociable. So that's not really necessarily a criticism of this sheikh or that sheikh, but this particular one, Abdullah ibn Adam al-Albani, rahmatullah alayhi wa hafidhullah, he was really uh, flexible. He didn't mind talking about all kind of things, just his life, what was going on, and sharing with me a lot of the things about the personal life of Al-Albani, who I got a chance to meet him, but I squandered the opportunity. Wallahu hu al musta'an. Also, Ikhwani, before I forget as well, from those people in Al-Kuwait with two other people, one is a sheikh who came here to Leicester. His name was Afayla Kawi. Al-Fayla Kawi. That's an island off of the Kuwait mainland. It was destroyed in the Gulf War. They destroyed it. And many of the people who lived there, they migrated to the mainland. He's from those people, Al-Fayla Kawi. I went into his masjid to meet Abu Muawiyah, who's there being very serious about getting knowledge. He went through the jamia and the sunnah of Imam al-Tirmidhi from the beginning to the end. And when I was there, it was going to be the last days when he was going to finish that book. So when I went to see Abu Muawiyah, I saw the sheikh. And when I went in to the majlis, I just went to sit down after praying two rakats in the back. I just went so that I can get the barakah of, I sat there, the malaika were there, but I had to get up and go because we had an appointment. But when I went in, the brother was reading the hadith, and the sheikh was looking at me when I was coming in. And his look was weird. It was just a moment. I didn't know what that was about. So I waved to him and gave him salams and I sat down. I left. After hearing about 12, 13, 14 hadith, the sheikh sent the message to the brothers that I should come back because I spoke to him when he was here in Leicester. And I had invited him to Green Lane, but I don't remember that story. So it's an example of what used to happen to some of the ulama of al-hadith, the people who worked with hadith in the past. A person will hear a hadith from someone. He would tell him that hadith, and then he would say, I don't remember that hadith. He forgot about it. He forgot about it. Like with what happened with Umar and Ammar ibn Yasir. When Umar became the khalifa, when Umar became the khalifa, Ammar ibn Yasir was asked a question. If a person has to make a ghusl and he doesn't have any water, what should he do? He said he should make tayammum and pray with the tayammum. And then when Umar heard that, Umar summoned Ammar, come, what are you doing giving that fatwa? He has to go and get water. He has to get water. Ammar said, La Amir al-Mu'mineen. Don't you remember when you and I were traveling? And we were together and we woke up with Janaba and I rolled around in the dirt and you said, I'm not doing that. And you prayed without wudu. And then we went to the Prophet wasallam, and we told him what happened and he smiled and he said, it's enough to make tayammum. Umar said, I don't remember that. That didn't happen. I don't remember that. He said, yes, it did. If you want me not to talk about it and tell the people about this incident, you're the Mirumu Minin. I won't tell them. 
He said, no, tell him about what you believe is right. So that's an example of Umar radiallahu anhu hearing, experiencing, being a part of something that had happened. He forgot about it. And that happened with the ulama. He may forget that he met this person. He may forget that he was told this hadith. He used to narrate that hadith and then he forgot about that hadith. And that's what happens with Benny Adam. So I didn't remember at all that I had ever spoken to the Sheikh al Faylakawi, but nonetheless, they have a brother, they have somebody like that teaching them. The last one is this other Sheikh, Abu Salah. Abu Salah. Muhammad ibn Hashim al Tahir. He's also from Afghanistan. And out of all of those people that I met, he was the one who was nitroglycerin. You guys know nitroglycerin, right? If you have a barrel of nitroglycerin, you put your finger in it, it'll freeze and fall off because it's powerful like that. So he was the one who was taking care of one of the diwans and afterwards when we were all leaving and I was feeling really, mashallah, incredibly high because of the love and the brotherhood of balance Serefiya. My brother Abu Muawiyah said, Abu Usami has some questions. He was asking another sheikh that I met. I met him on Wednesday night, or Thursday night. He used to live here and we didn't know his worth. He's none other than Abu Anas, Hamid ibn Ibrahim, Al Uthman. He was getting his PhD from Birmingham University 10, 15 years ago. When the Salafis of Birmingham were united, he was here. When we first started to break apart with this fitna, that's when he left. And he used to advise the brothers. He was an anchor because he had knowledge, but people didn't recognize his ability. People respected him when he was here, but then when the division started coming, they stopped respecting him. And he was an individual who, in Al-Kuwait, is one of the major shiyukh that they look up to. So I had an opportunity to meet. He hasn't met people for two and a half years. Two and a half years. He doesn't meet people in his house. But before I went, I told Abu Muawiyah, I know him. Tell him I want to come and see him. He said, sure. Tell him to come after Salat al-Asr. And we went all the way over there. And he sat with us from Asr to Maghrib time. So I'm glad that that opportunity didn't pass by. And I asked him, would you like to be connected with us here in the Dawah here? in uh, Birmingham since you've been here he said yeah he, don't, he doesn't mind being reconnected and he was one of those people that had beneficial ill he told me when I was there you should try to teach the Masail of Al-Jahiriyyah by Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab over there because this is one of the best books for the environment where you guys are living and where you're coming from but anyway that last sheikh Abu Salah in front of the house after the Diwaniyah I asked him some issues about Aqidah some issues about what reverts are concerned and reverts with the changing of our names with the woman and how the wali and the issue of the wali goes and so forth and so on. And I found him as well to be extremely, extremely accommodating with all of that knowledge. I mean, it was just, you just look and you say, subhanAllah, these people are blessed. So that was my trip to Al-Kuwait, Ikhwani. I mean, a lot of things happened while I was there. I just want to encourage you brothers, two groups of brothers from amongst you. If you're involved in Dawa, we can get you some Dawa resources, some books and things like that. People are ready to send that stuff to us right now, to you right now. And also, if you're interested in getting out of your parents' hair for three months, four months, then that opportunity is also available for any of you who wants to go. Just got to have a passport and you can't be a criminal. The other thing is, the other thing is, the other thing is, Travel, inshallah, travel, get an opportunity to travel. Don't stay here in Birmingham. Try to go back and see your people where you come from in Somalia, if the land is safe, in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, wherever you come from, in the Muslim world. Try to get out of the UK so that you can see there's more in this world that you have not seen than what you have actually seen. And with the broadening of your horizons, inshallah, you'll realize that as far as your future, the dunya is concerned, as well as knowledge is concerned, you can be all that you can possibly want to be, but you got to get out of this place, inshallah. Okay, Ikhwani, if you guys have any questions, you can put your questions forward. Uh, tomorrow morning, I'm going to be traveling to India, 13-hour trip, because I have to delay over there 
in Dubai for a few hours. I wanted to travel to India from Al Kuwait because it would have been easier. But staying in Kuwait for three extra days, not doing anything, it wasn't in the best interest of my family and so forth and so on. So I came back. And plus, I was missing you guys. Then I didn't even think about you guys while I was over there. No, I was missing you, brothers. I was making dua for brothers Zakaria, Nuruddin, Afdal, Amr, Abu Isa, all of you. Because we want, you guys are still trying to find your way. Where are you going to study? What are you going to do? This one wants to go to Egypt. That one, he wants to travel over He wants to travel over Inshallah, you get in where you fit in. But just do the groundwork before you do it. And I think Abu Isa, you went to Kuwait, right? You didn't go. Did anybody here actually take the trip to Kuwait? Anybody here did that? No, someone went from here, brother, who's Qasim and Sufyan. Yeah, I knew somebody went from here. So maybe they canceled one, but there are multiple ones to do. And the ones that the brothers went to before, they were not plugged into the people that I was plugged into. So we would encourage you. You want to do it? You rap to me. You let me know. So we're going to go to meet some of the ulama of al-Hadith in India. I've been to Calcutta before, to Chennai on a trip, and to Madras where the ulama of al-Hadith of India are. But now I'm going to go to the southern part of India, a place, inshallah, called uh, Kerala. Kerala. Go do a program there and also meet some of the people who are there. So we ask Allah Azza wa to make that successful for us. But we'll be back. So this Friday, I won't be doing the khutbah here. This Friday, I won't be doing the khutbah here in Green Lane, inshallah. We're going to stop here, inshallah. We ask Allah Ta'ala for his rahmah, for his maghfirah, for his ihsan upon us, and for his al-hidayah and al-thabat. Hatha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyyina wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.